see what everyone's talking about. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be unto you. You see, you already learned something here on the Dean Show, which is a way of life. My name ain't Dean, my name is Eddie, and I'm your host, trying to educate you on Islam and Muslims. And today, we're going to be talking about culture versus Islam. All right. In certain cultures, you got certain foods, tasty, delicious, but you got some other things. So we want to know that is it a part of Islam? Is it? We want to give you the formula to be able to distinguish what is Islam, what is culture, what is Islam, and what's been made up by Sheikh B or whoever. So we're gonna take a break, bring our guests out, Yasser Qadi in a second. Sit tight. We're right back on the Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for being with us, uh, with us again on the Dean Show. How you been? I've been fine. It's always my pleasure to come and, and, and help you guys out. And I'm really happy at what you're doing. And I'm really happy to, to answer questions and, and be involved with your projects. It, it really makes me happy. You're doing an excellent job on the Dean Show. And anything I can do to help out, I'm always at your service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to get straight down to the topic, Shay. All right? We want to talk about... Giving people the formula, people just coming to Islam, mm. even some, some Muslims who've been practicing Islam for, for a long time, but now, you know what, there's some things that the Prophet never did, he never taught, mm -hmm. there's no sanction for it in Islam. How do we decipher what is Islam and what's culture? And does it necessarily conflict if we kind of, mm -hmm. like some people say, it, you know, it might be too dry for them, so they want to spice it up. Is this allowed? Mm -hmm. So if you can break this down for us so we can get a lucid understanding, clear. <clears throat> okay, this is a really uh, a good question and one that we can really talk a lot about. But to, to summarize, as Muslims, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be our perfect role model. So his job was to explain what we need to do as Muslims. He came to teach us our religion. He didn't come to teach us the secular sciences. He didn't come to teach us engineering, physics, mathematics. He came to teach us our religion. He is a prophet from God who teaches us what we need to believe, what we need to do in the sphere of religion, and what's going to save us from uh, the punishment of Allah and cause us to enter his paradise. With that role in mind, we believe that the Prophet Muhammad gave the complete message of Islam. In other words, he didn't leave any ambiguity in the message. He didn't leave any room for change because the teachings he came with were eternal teachings. He said uh, in so many uh, different narrations, he said in one of them, I have left you upon the straight path or the shining path. Its night is like its day, meaning it's crystal clear. In another tradition, he said, every single prophet sent by God had to tell his nation of the good that he knew so that they could follow it and the bad that they knew that he knew so that they could stay away from it. In another tradition, he said, there is nothing that brings you closer to Allah except that I've told you about it. And there's nothing that takes you away from Him towards the fire of hell except that I've warned you about not doing it. And so we believe that as Allah Himself says in the Quran, the religion of Islam is a complete and perfect religion. One of the last verses to be revealed in the Quran is Al-Yawma Akmatu Lakum Deenakum. Today I have completed and perfected my religion to you. Something that's perfect, you don't tinker with it. You don't subtract, you don't add. Something that's perfect doesn't need a version. Version 1, version 2, version 3, it's perfect. The reason why we have so many versions of software and Microsoft and this is because it's not perfect. You've got bugs, you've got flaws, you've got holes. So they need to patch it up, they need to do this, they need to do that until they release the new product. Suppose they could come with a product that did everything it had to do and it didn't have any flaws. If you changed it, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? You would have to change it for the worse. That's what we believe our religion is. With this 
background in mind. We say that our Prophet ﷺ told us each and everything that we need to know with regards to worshipping Allah. If anybody comes and says, no, I have a better way to worship Allah, that is a serious problem. Because what they're saying is that, I know better than the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, and what Muslim is going to say that? If anybody comes and says, oh, the Prophet ﷺ didn't have to do something because he's so great, and we're so sinful, we have to do better than him. Well, you know what? That's exactly what some of the Sahaba felt as well, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Mm-hmm. They came to his house, and he wasn't there. And they saw his wife Aisha, uh, behind the curtain, behind the veil, and they said, okay, well if he's not here, why don't you tell us how his lifestyle is? You tell us what he does to worship Allah. And so, she described the day in the Prophet's life. But these overzealous companions, they felt, what is this? He eats normal food, he you know, goes to the mosque and goes to his business. In other words, they felt that they could do more. And so they said, as for the Prophet wasallam, Allah has chosen him and forgiven his sins and he is such a great person, we have to do more than him. So one of them said, as for me, I am going to fast every single day of my life. The Prophet never fasted every day of his life, except in Ramadan. Otherwise, he never fasted every day of the month. The second one said, as for me, I will never sleep at night. I will stand up in prayer every single night from sunset to sunrise. Never sleep at night, just sleep a few hours in the day. And the third one said, as for me, I will leave marrying women and basically live a celibate life for the sake of God. When the Prophet ﷺ returned home, his wife told him about the incident of the three men. See, these three men, they thought they knew better. Not that the Prophet was ignorant. They said, oh, he's too good for us. We can do something better for ourselves. They didn't discredit the Prophet. They didn't disbelieve him. Look at the mentality. They respected him so much, they said, that's for him. We can do better for ourselves. So when the Prophet heard this, he called the huge gathering of the companions. And he invited everybody to come to the mosque. And he said, why is it that people think that you know they can do better than me that they say they're going to start uh, leave eating during the day and, and sleep during and leave sleep during the night and stop marrying women he said the best sunnah is my sunnah he said whoever leaves my way sunnah means my way whoever leaves my way has nothing to do with me in other words our religion tells us to live a proper life in accordance to the teachings of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that includes especially religious acts of worship hence Anytime somebody comes and says, this is the way we need to worship Allah. You are allowed to ask him a simple, respectful question. Don't be rude, don't be obnoxious. If you haven't heard of this before, if you haven't seen where this thing comes from, you say, oh, well this is a, seems like a very good act. Can you tell me uh, where did the Prophet do this? Can you narrate to me some tradition that he said we should do this? And if he does, and you think it's like an authentic tradition, or you can check yourself if he says it's in Bukhari or it's in Muslim, or you can go to a scholar, another scholar, and you can verify with him, then Alhamdulillah, go for it. If the Prophet told you to do it, do it. But if he says, well, my teacher told me, or who are you to question my knowledge of the religion? That's not a very humble thing to say because we're not questioning your knowledge we're just verifying did our Prophet say this or not that's all we're trying to do I'm not questioning your knowledge but if you have knowledge you should be able to quote me where you got it from so if he tells you something that doesn't make sense he goes my tradition tells me my teacher told me then something doesn't make sense and this is especially we're talking about especially for actions of worship on the other hand if he tells you something to do with your daily life about simple stuff of eating, drinking, cuisine, dress code. This has a lot to do with culture. Our religion gave us general guidelines. Don't eat pork, don't drink alcohol, don't do this and that. And the rest is up to us. If one of us prefers Pakistani food over Arab food, Bosnian food over Egyptian food, that's completely permissible because our religion did not dictate to us these preferences. As long as it doesn't conflict with the religious law. So here we have, you asked me the general guideline, right? I'll give it to you, simple. There are two spheres of human involvement or human actions. The first sphere is a natural sphere. In other words, a sphere which we interact and do things because we're human beings. We eat, we drink, we dress, we go to work, we speak languages, we take communications and take vehicles. This is the natural sphere. With regards to the natural realm, how do we know something is natural? Because everybody does it, regardless of religion. Everybody does it. If you're in 
America, pretty much everybody dresses in a certain way. Religion doesn't dictate it. Mm -hmm. If you're in Pakistan, Christians and Muslims dress in a similar way. If you're in other lands, there are other things as well. Cuisine, food, that's a natural thing. With regards to natural uh, daily activities that we do, professions you choose, you want to be an engineer, doctor, whatever. The general rule, now pay attention to this, the general rule, everything is permissible. Unless our Sharia gives you something prohibited. So if you want to dress in a certain way, somebody says, my dear brother, Akhi, you can't dress like that. He has to tell you why not. You don't have to prove, oh, this is permissible to dress like this. He has to prove, what does he have to prove? That it's not permissible. That it's not permissible. Yes. The general rule, everything is permissible when it comes to your daily activities of natural life. Mm -hmm. You understand that point? Yes. Okay. There's another few. I said there's two things men do, human beings. First is natural things, eating, drinking, dressing, cuisine, etc. The second thing they do is religious acts. How do you know something is religious? Because it varies from religion to religion. If you're in America, you're both going to be dressed the same, you like the same food, but the Christian will go to church on Sunday, the Muslim will go to Jama'ah on Friday. That's a religious act. Okay, with regards to religious acts, the rule is exactly reversed. Which rule? The first rule that I said. Yes. Which is, the first rule was everything is permissible unless proven otherwise. With regards to religious acts, it's the exact opposite. Everything is impermissible unless you prove this is permissible. In other words, somebody comes and says, I want to worship Allah today by dancing around and clapping and doing something like that. You say, brother, that's not allowed. He says, what's your evidence it's not allowed? You don't have to quote evidence. He has to quote evidence that it is allowed. The burden of proof lies, the burden of proof lies upon somebody who does an action of worship. Gotcha. Whereas natural acts, the burden of proof lies upon somebody who? Somebody who wants to do what? Someone who wants to prohibit it. Prohibit it. Yeah, natural acts. Yeah. Somebody says you can't eat this food. That food is not allowed. You don't have to prove it's allowed. You say, look, food is allowed unless you prove to me it's not. Somebody says, Allah says pork is haram. You say, okay, that's fine. Okay, Allah says alcohol is not, okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you got any other type of meal which has various elements of halal and the process of never ate it, okay? Okay, national dish of Pakistan is biryani, right? You know biryani. Everybody knows biryani, right? The process of never ate biryani. In fact, he never ate rice. Somebody comes and says, that's a bid'ah. That's an innovation. You're doing something the Prophet didn't do. Your response is, Akhi, you don't know the meaning of bid'ah. You don't know the meaning of innovation. Innovation cannot occur in worldly actions. Innovations can only occur in religious actions. So if I want to make a nice uh, sports coat, or if I want to go ahead, uh, innovate a nice uh, sports car to go faster. Excellent. Or some computers, soap, computers, or technology. Go right any, ahead. Go right ahead. As long as the general guidelines are met. For example, for example, you can't use pig when you uh, you want to make a new type of soap product, right? Yeah. You can't use pig. Uh -huh. That's a general rule. Yeah. Apart from that, specific things that are prohibited, everything is permissible. You want to invent a new item. Well, make sure that the basic prerequisites are permissible, and then go for it. The the specific are not governed by the Sharia. But now something in getting closer to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Exactly. Allah, now I have to have You have evidence. to have proof. It has to be in our blueprint. Exactly. The Quran and the Sunnah. Exactly. Because if it's That's not the there, if it's not there, then you're inventing a religious act that is not found in our tradition. And what's the dangers of this? The dangers is you're basically putting yourself up for prophethood. You're basically saying, I know better. You're basically saying the Prophet didn't give us the guidance. You're saying that the religion is open. You can come and do one thing. I'll come and add another. A third person will come and add a third thing. Until what will be left of the religion. If the religion were to be left open like this, then within one generation, that whole religion will change completely. But what if someone comes to you and says, Look, Ahi, brother, that our beloved Prophet, peace be upon him, said that whoever brings something good into this thing will have the reward of it. And Excellent. He you this. Yes. What do you do? Whoever brings something good into the religion will have the reward until the Day of Judgment. Yeah. The end of the hadith, whoever brings something bad yeah. will have its sin to the Day of Judgment. What does this mean, good and bad? Well, if we understand the context of the hadith, everything becomes clear. Context. Yes. What is the hadith? When was the hadith said? I'll tell you when. Mm -hmm. A poor man came. And he could barely cover his, his private parts because he had any, hardly any clothes, tattered clothing, nothing on there. 
And so the Prophet saw this man and he felt so much mercy, so much sympathy. Here is a companion of mine and he doesn't even have enough clothes to cover his nakedness properly. Tattered dress here and there. And so he stood up and he exhorted the people and give a sermon. He gave a sermon about the blessings of giving charity and help your Muslim brothers out. For a while, nobody did anything. You know what happens when you first hear something, you're like mulling it over. And then one person stood up, went back home, and brought a little bit of dates or something. Trivial thing, but basically, okay, I don't have money to give you, but here's some food. When somebody saw the man go up and come back, he said, you know what, I can do better. And so he came and he brought back a little bit more. And then a third man, and then a fourth man. And so this first man, what did he do? He started a domino of good events. He's, he was the catalyst. When people saw him, they said, that's a good thing, I can do it too. And so in context to that, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does something good, whoever follows him will get the reward as well. Whoever does something bad, whoever follows him will get the evil as well. The good that he did giving charity, this is a part of our religion. Mm -hmm. For you to use this and say, oh, any type of good deed in the religion. Listen to this carefully. There is no good deed you can add to the religion that our Prophet ﷺ didn't do. You can't add any good deed. Anything you add to the religion is bad. And the evidence for this is another tradition in which uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever introduces something into this matter of ours, into this religion of ours, will have it rejected from him. Meaning Allah will not accept it, the people will not accept it. People are not, Allah Azza wa most importantly, is not going to accept this deed from you. Whoever, and memorize this tradition, whoever introduces something, this hadith is in Bukhari, the most authentic book of hadith, whoever introduces something into this religion, in this, this affair, this matter of ours, will have it rejected. Rejected. Home. Rejected. You're wasting your time. Wasting your time. It's like the inspector comes and you're working on a house and the blueprint says two windows and you said, you know, I, I know think better. Four, I think yeah. four are nice. It's not it's your job. Have, it's, it's not you your say, job. Tear it down. The Prophet gave us the blueprint. We just have to erect the building. Do those deeds in accordance Do with Islam, that. Do Islam. Submit. Do Write Islam. Exactly. Okay, you've memorized the whole Quran. Is that correct? Alhamdulillah. Okay, so if I bring something up and I ask you, because I want to give some examples to give a better understanding uh, for, to the people. So you know the Quran and its meaning, correct? Alhamdulillah. You know many of the uh, prophetic traditions, you've studied a long time. So, and is it, if you now go ahead and say something's not part of Islam, is that a big no-no on your end? You can get in trouble with Allah? Of course, there's so, no doubt. So it's not in your interest to say, okay, this is haram. It's or for Allah, not at okay, all. Okay, I just wanted not to at make all. that point clear. Let's give some examples now. Uh, and I've collected this from some people to help make it easier for us so we can... Because there are some people probably who might have been doing this for many years. So we are sensitive to that. 40 days. After 40 days, for 40 days when someone dies, leaving a cup, okay, full of water uh, for the deceased every night. Part of the deen or not? Not at you, all. Not at there all. There is nothing narrated okay. in any tradition. Nothing at all. At all. In fact, I ask every Muslim to use the brain that Allah has given them and ask themselves, doesn't this sound paganistic? Yeah. Doesn't it sound against the, the, the purity? Our religion isn't a superstitious religion. There's no mumbo jumbo. Yeah. There's no weird stuff like this. You know, somebody dies, you leave a glass room to drink from. This to me sounds like an ancient pharaonic you know, religion <laughs> that when the pharaoh died, they would put everything, his, they would put his horses and animals and food and drink. But, they thought he'd need it there. But, but my, my, my uncle went to Hajj five times and, and, and and our people have been doing this, Sheikh, and, and our Imam justified it from our village. I'm not accusing your uncle or your Imam or your village of being insincere to God. Allah knows whether they're sincere or not. But I can say that even if they're sincere, that's not good enough. They might be good. Your uncle might really want good for you. He loves you. But he hasn't studied the religion in the proper way. He's been taught it by the locals. Many of the local scholars even have been graduating from their local madrasas and they're just they're like, everybody does it, I want to do it as well. All you need to do is ask them, where did you get this from? Where is Where'd your, you get, what's, the which, basis? what's the basis of this? Okay, All you need gonna, to do. We're going to start going on. You can uh, continue on and then uh, go ahead and elaborate on some of these. Uh, during Maghrib time, no hot water in the sink because you might burn the gin. <laughs> 
<laughs> I take it by your I'm, laughing. I'm, 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 I'm learning. Uh, so. I'm learning a lot from you. Okay. But I'm not learning the religion. Yeah, these are real <laughs> questions that I okay. uh, extracted from not the people at all. to ask. Not at all. No such thing at all. Okay. Again, 40 days, and then there's a seventh day, then a 40 day, something like this. Someone passes away, reciting Yasin every night for this individual, and on the seventh day or the 40th day, getting together at the masjid and reciting Quran for the deceased. Yeah, to come together to recite the Quran for the deceased is something that has not been narrated from any of the uh, ancient scholars of our religion and tradition. And had there been good in, good in this, then the first people to have done so would be the Sahaba after the Prophet had passed away. Or when any Sahaba passed away, they would have done it for each other. Or when a Sahaba passed away, their students, the Tabi'un, the successors would have done it for them. But we don't have any such narration. I ask you, when the great Imams died, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad al Muhammad, when the great scholars of Hadith Bukhari, Muslim when they died. Did their students do this for them? And they didn't. It's not narrated at all. There's, this concept was unknown. If they didn't do it, well then where did it come from? For the first hundreds of years of Islam, we don't have any of these actions coming in. Where did it come from? I'll tell you where it came from. When a person passes away, there's this feeling, I gotta do something for him. I want to do something. He's just dead. I want to help my father. I want to help my mother. You know what? The Quran is the best book. Let's all get some Muslims together. Let's read the Quran. That's how it started. But his intention might have been in the right place. But his mind wasn't. If he wanted to do good for his parents, you know what he should have done? He should have followed the advice of the Prophet ﷺ who told us, there's lots of things you can do for somebody who's passed on. You can do Hajj, you can do Umrah, you can give charity to the poor and expect a reward from Allah. You can sacrifice an animal in the name of Allah. Say Bismillah and then give the meat to those who need it, give it to the poor. You can visit the relatives of your deceased parents or whatever and, and, and fulfill ties of kinship with them. So many things you can do. But he never said, when somebody dies on the seventh day, come together and read Quran. On the 40th day, come together and have a Quran Khani. He never said that. So the question arises, if he didn't do it, if the companions didn't do it, if the earliest generations didn't do it, why should we do it? It's not in the blueprint. It's not in the blueprint. It's going to be rejected. We should reject it. How about if you got good intention though? It doesn't matter. It doesn't Same matter. Same what you said earlier with those Sahaba yeah. that came, they had good intention. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, so they follow had good the intention. blueprint. Okay, exactly. continue on. Uh, you can't fall asleep, cut nails, and take a shower during Maghrib time. Have you heard that one? Never heard that one either. Okay. You shouldn't fall asleep at Maghrib time because you got to pray. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Or if you want to delay it for a little bit, that's fine. But yeah. once you pray, <laughs> you can do whatever you please. Okay, so this is something, uh, what at do you want to call it? Just made up? Uh, cultural, cultural superstitions. Cultural su superstitions which have no precedence in Not at Islam. all. Not okay. at all. Uh, another one going on next. Talking. Okay, uh, after someone dis dis uh, passes away again from this mm -hmm. world, what is the proper procedure? We can do a whole show on this, but in short, is it proper that people have a collective gathering around the grave, and then they recite a particular surah such as Yasin, and then uh, and also other verses back and forth uh, when somebody passes away? Uh, during the life of the Prophet oh, one of the companions passed away, and the Prophet was there at the grave. He was there. He was there. Yes. So what better example to follow than his example? The teacher's right there. He's right there. You ready to learn? So what happened? Well, they were digging the grave. Because, you know, in our times, the grave was already dug. But in those days, come on, they have a lot of things to do. they got to earn their food, you know. Yeah. So when a person died, they would dig the grave after his death. Uh -huh. So they took the body to the graveyard, and they were waiting for uh, the, the, the grave to be dug and the body to be placed in. And so the process gave them a short reminder about death and about the fact it's inevitable. Every, everybody's going to come there. But that's mm -hmm. something he did because there was time there. Yeah. Once the body was placed in, and they started putting the sand out uh, down onto his body, the Prophet ﷺ said, make dua for the person in the grave because the angels are coming to ask. And so he stood there for a while, maybe 10 minutes, 15, there was no watch back then. But he stood for a period of time that wasn't really long and it wasn't ridiculously short. And maybe, as I said, 5, 10, 15 minutes would be a reasonable assumption. And he made dua individually himself. He didn't have a joint congregational dua. He didn't say, oh Sahaba, come behind me, we will all say Ameen out loud. And he is the Prophet of Allah Wasallam. What dua is better to be accepted than his? If he wanted to do a joint dua, what better opportunity? But he didn't. 
he himself made dua and he said each one of you should make dua too. And so they all made dua for the person in the grave that, oh Allah, forgive his sins, oh Allah, grant him paradise. Duas that are found in, in the Quran Sunnah. And if you don't know these duas, say them in your language for the deceased, genuinely from the heart. Oh Allah, forgive his sins, cleanse him of all the wrong that he's done, increase his ranks in paradise, etc., etc. You do that. And then that's it, you move on. He didn't sit around, he didn't recite any specific verses for the deceased, he didn't do any of this. Why shouldn't we follow the way of the Prophet I mean, It doesn't make any sense to reject that and say, I know better. Don't you think? I mean, you know, as a simple Muslim, I would say, yeah, it's not in the blueprint. It's not there. I don't want to get uh, rejected. Leave get all, of, yeah, and, leave all of these okay. things that haven't been found in the blueprint, leave them out. We are just trying to uh, make it easier on everybody. So please, uh, I know a lot of you are sincere out there and you might have fell into doing some of these things and like I stressed earlier, it is actually very bad and a great sin for you to say something is uh, not part of our tradition when it actually is. Now, okay. let, me, let me ask you a question here yeah. and I'll answer myself. If somebody comes and says, you've just said that culturally things are fine, what if I say this is in my culture to do this or this? Very good question, yes. Right? What if I say, fine, it's in my culture. The response is, this is not a cultural phenomenon to pray to Allah in a specific manner. It's a religious one. Mm -hmm. Had you been a Christian, you wouldn't be doing this. I said the, the rule or the benchmark, I mean the rule of thumb, how do you differentiate between what is natural cultural things and what is religious, that is not dependent on a religion. The day that you come and say this involves Allah and His Messenger, involves the Quran and Sunnah, involves dhikr, dua, involves prayer, that's not cultural anymore. Okay, if you want to be cultural, then do things that don't pertain to uh, the fundamentals of your religion. Don't pertain to theology. Do things that have to do with your culture. I'll give you another specific rule, and this is an important one. Anything that you think brings you closer to Allah is religious. Mm -hmm. So if you do it, it's got to be found in the textbook. So if your relative dies, okay, mm -hmm. and you do something that you think will bring comfort to your deceased relative in the grave. That's religious. You do something thinking that Allah is happy at what you're doing. That's religious. So you have to be careful that not just because something is cultural, uh, it has nothing to do with the religion. Anything that you think brings you closer to Allah becomes religious. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a few more examples and we're going to uh, cut on out. Uh, res making the intention to pray out loud, saying, I intend to pray with her at this masjid, at this time, and wait to an asallallah, and uh, then yeah, Allahu Akbar. Some of the people did this to teach their children and stuff, and then it became so cultural, everybody does it. I mean, if you're just teaching a little kid, you know, that, uh, you know, how do you, what type of intention you make, you can tell him that when you stand up to pray, you put in your mind that I'm praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a of Dhuhr, for example, okay? But he doesn't have to verbalize it. It doesn't have to come as a sentence. So this too should be avoided. Okay, so intentions in the heart. Intentions in the heart. Okay, uh, coming to pray congregational prayer and then the Imam having uh, a second person uh, helping him through the whole process. After he prays, then he throws it back and the, then the uh, muaddin or someone else, he recites some verses and then they do a collective uh, zikr at the end and then at the end they do a collective uh, dua and then they recite al-fatiha. When you say that the muaddin helps him, what do you mean by that? So after the Imam prays. After he finishes, says the salam. Yeah, then it goes back to the muaddin. What does he do? He will recite some verses from the Quran. Then it goes uh, to everybody saying subhanallah 33 times then he'll say some more things uh, from the Quran then alhamdulillah and then subhanallah and then from there collective dua raising the hands and then from there reciting mm -hmm. al-fatiha all of this goes back Things a little to, complicated yeah yeah all of this goes back to a person who has the right intentions but not the right methodology they wanted to do good, they wanted the people to stay and do dhikr and recite some Qur'an, but that's not the way you do it. You mm -hmm. know, just because something, you want to do something good doesn't mean everything you do because that intention will become good. This is not the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. Yes. The Prophet ﷺ told us after the prayer, remain seated, say SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar 33, 33, 33 times, okay, mm -hmm. do your dhikr, say various things, say some surahs of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas, Surah Ayat Al-Kursi, you're supposed to say these things, but they're supposed to be done individually. To do them collectively, 
breaks the concentration, you yourself don't have as much humility as you should, and you're making it into an innovation because you think this is the way it should be done. You don't have to do it. And also, you're making Islam difficult because to do that is not a requirement. Yeah. There are people that have to go back to their businesses. You don't have to force Islam more difficult upon them. It's not wajib for them to sit there and do this dhikr. If they have to go, they have to go. And if, even if they don't have to go and they leave, they're not sinful. So to do it in this manner goes against the spirit and the letter of the law. Okay, couple more and we're out. After reciting the Quran each and every time, saying Sadaqallah al-Azim. Yeah, this is a very common habit. There is nothing narrated uh, from the uh, from the Quran itself. Even though Allah says, when you start reciting the Quran, say Audhu Billah. Yeah. Allah says so in the Quran. So Audhu Billah is mentioned, and Allah revealed Bismillah Rahman Rahim at the beginning of every surah. So that's found. You would think if Allah told us the beginning and there was an ending to say, He would have told us that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, then because He didn't, it shows us that there's no specific way to end recitation. Therefore, you end recitation by simply ending the recitation. You don't have to say anything at the end. Now, the phrase Sadaqallahul Azim is true. Allah speaks the truth. Okay, Allah the, Gra the Magnificent speaks the truth. That's the meaning of Sadaqallahul Azim. The phrase is true. Say it anytime you want because Allah always speaks the truth. But to make it linked to finishing the Quran is something, this linkage hasn't occurred. And it's problematic because the average Muslim now makes Sadaqallahul Azim the same as A'udhu Billah and Bismillah, that you have to do it. That's problematic because the Prophet never did it. So we have to be careful here once again that we should avoid such extremism that you have to do something like this. I'm not saying Sadaqallahul Azim is wrong because Sadaqallahul Azim, the phrase is right. What I'm saying is to link it to ending the Quran every single time, that's where the wrong comes. Nothing wrong with saying Sadaqallahul Azim, no, just wrong. linking it each and every exactly. time and making a requirement yes. Yes. is a no-no. That's the problem. It's not in the blueprint. Not in the blueprint as well. Quran yeah. Sunnah is no... Exactly. Okay. Alright, now uh, this event bringing the people together, the families, uh, the community to celebrate the Prophet, peace be upon him, his Salaam. birthday. Is this part of uh, Islam? This is another classic example of people wanting to do good. They want to, you know, uh, uh, help uh, you know, or, or, or somehow raise the status of the Prophet ﷺ by doing something that you know they think is good, and it's become such a common practice that when you come and say, "Hold on a sec, something's fishy here," people look at you weird. When you come and say, and this is true, for 600 years in Islam, no Muslim scholar, no major uh, Muslim kh Khalifa, no a theologian, scholar of hadith fiqh ever spoke about the concept of celebrating the birthday because they had no idea of something called a birthday. The concept of celebrating a birthday is not an Islamic concept. It didn't come to their minds. So for 600 years after the death of the Prophet Nobody in the entire Muslim lands, Islam Muslim, we're not talking about Christians with Christmas, Muslims are not celebrating the birth of the Prophet. Why? Abu Hanifa, none of them. of them. Buhari, Muslim. None, none of them. Because the concept was not even in their heads. Mm -hmm. They didn't warn against it either because nobody did it. Yeah. You understand? They did it. It's like the thing doesn't even arise in their heads that somebody would do that. It's non existent. Then, in the year around 620 something or so, one of the uh, you know, uh, mystical groups, the Sufi groups, one of them, in the fringes of the, of the Muslim Ummah, they decided to do this, this deed. And some scholars say that this act, the thought of it came from celebrating Christmas. That when the Christians show respect to Jesus Christ, then these guys thought that they could do better and show respect to the process by celebrating his birthday. Okay? And so it was started at the fringe of the Ummah in the areas of Khorasan, far, far away. And then it caught and spread like wildfire in the next 200 years. It took two centuries. And in the beginning, most of the scholars were opposed to it. And we have many scholars who actually wrote fatwa against it. Some of them said, oh, this is a really strange thing. It's a bid'ah, it's an innovation. But there's also some good that the Muslims come together and they mention the Prophet ﷺ, they send salat and salam upon him. And of the people who said this is a very famous scholar, Ibn Hajar. Ibn Hajar al asqalani the famous Ibn Hajar. He said, this is a bid'ah. The Prophet ﷺ never did it. But there's good in it as well because people come together and they mention Allah and the Prophet and they just talk about the seerah, etc, etc. So, others opposed and they said, no, there can't be any such thing as a good bid'ah. 
this whole concept of good bid'ah doesn't uh, doesn't occur to them. So in our times, it's become a huge controversy. And those who affirm it, we compassionate. Those who deny, be compassionate. Each group accuses the other of this and that. I just have a simple question: Can you outdo the companions in your love for the Prophet Sallallahu Can you do better than Abu Bakr and Umar? No way. Well, then why don't you just stick with their way? I'm not even getting into is it haram bid'ah shirk. I'm not saying anything. I'm just asking a simple question. Isn't it safer? That's all I'm asking. Isn't it safer to stick with the earliest generations and how they love the Prophet ﷺ? When something is so much controversy, you've got so much heated debates, isn't it better to just stick with how Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhum, how Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, how they did it? And you know how they did it? They followed the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That's the way to show your love. You know why people love the birthday of the Prophet Because it gives them a false sense of I love the Prophet I'm going to do on this day what I do on no other day of the year. But that's the whole point. You're supposed to love the Prophet every day of the year. And you show that love by following his life and teachings. So every day should be celebrating the birth of the Prophet How? By doing what he told you to do. That's how you celebrate. The, the mercy of the Prophet That's how you show your love. Not by taking, and that's why people love it so much. And I'll be just honest, I don't want to offend anybody, but this is a psychological thing. That it's, it's, it's basically, it's like a placebo. It makes you feel good, yeah. right? It makes you feel good is that, oh, I'm showing my love by doing this on this day. I'm going to spend money on this day. I'm going to do that. But you know, for the rest of the year, you do nothing. Well, then that's a problem, isn't it? That's a big problem. And it, 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 you understand why people are so emotional about celebrating this one day. Because they feel that if I defend this, I'm defending the love of the Prophet No, if you really loved the Prophet your lifestyle would be in accordance with his. That's how you would love the Prophet It makes complete sense. Now, for someone to go ahead and just, they have a good intention, they keep doing these good deeds. I just want to elaborate on this point one more time that it is clear that you mentioned the hadith that even though, now if somebody didn't know, but now they're watching the show, mm -hmm. it's different than a person that didn't know, right? Oh, sure. If a person doesn't know and he genuinely and sincerely does a deed, thinking that this is the religion, his sheikh told him, his teacher told him, and he trusts that teacher, and thinking this is what Allah wants him to do, inshallah Allah will reward him for that deed because Allah judges based on intention. But that doesn't mean you remain in ignorance. Nobody likes to be ignorant, right? You don't remain in ignorance. Once you realize that this is not something from our religion, you leave it alone? You should just leave it. So now if that person is receiving the message from here, Sheikh B or the Imam from the village is listening right now, and that person continues on doing these things even after the clear evidence comes to him, how dangerous is this, Sheikh? If the person knows that this is not the truth and he still does it, this is a sign of major sin. It's a sign of, uh, of arrogance because the Prophet said, arrogance is to reject the truth while you know it's the truth. If a person's confused, now for example, he's been celebrating the birthday of the Prophet his whole life, and now he hears this video clip of mine, and he's like, who is this guy to tell me this is wrong? Okay, that's fair enough. All I can do then is ask you one simple thing, go do the research. He's got to bring the evidence. Yeah, go do the research. You don't have to trust me then, I'm not asking you to believe me blindly. But go do the research, find out for yourself. Did uh, the, the Prophet and tell the people to celebrate his own birthday? Did the companions celebrate his birthday? Did the earliest Muslims do? If they didn't, well then, why are we doing it now? So you go and you know, nobody claims that the Prophet, that the companions celebrated the birthday of the Prophet. Nobody says that. They know they did. Not even the groups that celebrate their birthday. They don't even justify it through the companions and the Tabi'un and Imam Malik. They don't. You know why? Because there's nothing narrated from them that substantiates that belief. Two things. There's going to be a well. I want to drink from that well. Is it true that certain people who innovate things or are on innovation in religion, in the deen, that they're not going to be able to drink from this you're well. Referring, you're referring to the blessed well of the Prophet ﷺ yes. in the hereafter. And you'll never be thirsty You'll again. never be thirsty after that, yes. That's a blessed well. It's called Al-Hawd. Al-Hawd means the pool or the cistern. or uh, It's basically like a container of water. But it's not just a normal container. It's a container, the Prophet ﷺ said, it's like a square. And one side of it is the distance between Mecca and Yemen. That's like half the Arabian Peninsula. That's one side of the square. And there's a square. And that square is to cater to the Ummah of the Prophet to drink on the Day of Judgment when there is no other place to drink except from that well. And we pray that Allah makes us from the people who drink from that well. 
The Prophet told us that the water in that well, it is sweeter than honey, it is wider than milk, it is colder than ice. He told us that the number of containers that people can drink from that well are equal to the stars in the sky. He told us that whoever drinks from that well will never ever be thirsty ever after that. Just one sip. But he also told us that a group will come to drink from that well. And he will say, he will first call them because he'll think that they're good Muslims. Then the angels will say, go away from here. And so the Prophet will tell the angels, those people are my followers. And the angels will say, you don't know what they innovated after you went away. You don't know that they've changed the religion. Innovate, they use the word innovated. After you went away, after you left, after you died, they don't know, you don't know that. And so when the angels tell the Prophet ﷺ, these people innovated, he said, Suhqan, Suhqan, get away, get away to those who changed after me. So he tells them, he's not, they, you're not, you changed the religion. You thought you knew better than what I came with. Why should you drink from my fountain then? So they will not get to drink from that fountain. May Allah protect us from that. Ameen, Ameen. One last point. Is it true that Allah the Almighty, is there a hadith stating that Allah puts the one's deeds on hold who continues doing bid'ah or continues innovating or continues following innovation? There, there are some, some traditions to this regard uh, but scholars of hadith generally consider them to be not uh, authentic. But there's authentic traditions that say for example uh, that whoever innovates uh, especially in, in Mecca or Medina, whoever does these deeds within these cities, especially Allah says, upon him is the curse of Allah and the angels and all of mankind. That hadith is in Bukhari. Yeah. That hadith is in Bukhari. And so there are, there are other things as well uh, that, that talk about the severity of innovation. Mm-hmm. You know, and of them, as we said, is that whoever does something, it will be rejected from him. Okay? It's not going to be accepted from him. And uh, changing the religion is something that goes against the Qur'an itself. Because the Qur'an says it's a perfect message. It's a complete message. So when you come with something else, like Imam Malik said, whoever thinks that they know more uh, than the Prophet, sorry, whoever thinks there's a good innovation, whoever thinks there's something good he can add, then he has charged Allah with lying. Because he's saying that the religion is not complete. That's a deep point. Mm-hmm. You're saying, if you say this is something good that I know that Allah and His Messenger didn't tell us to do. Imam Malik said, you are saying that Allah didn't speak the truth when He said the religion is complete. Because you seem to have completed it and not Allah and His Messenger. So it is very, very dangerous. It's a, it's a door that if you open it, there's no shutting it afterwards. You need to just shut it from its roots and say, religion comes from the Quran and Sunnah. Not from me, not from my teachers, not from you, not from your teachers. It comes from the Quran and Sunnah. Even me, I don't, I tell my students when I teach them, you are not allowed to blindly follow me. Any teacher who says blindly follow me, don't ask, just do what I, as I say. That teacher is the one you need to turn your back and flee from. I tell my students, unless I quote you Quran and Hadith, unless I tell you where I get my things from, especially religious actions, especially beliefs and theology. I have no right to speak about the religion of Islam unless Allah and His Messenger have said so. Then I'm not speaking, I'm narrating. That's my right. As for inventing, as for changing, A'udhu Billah, seek Allah's refuge. That's not the job of an alim. That's not the job of a scholar. The job of the scholar is to pass the message down. That's what his job is. To get it from the sources, give it to the people. Closing comments and advice for the Sheikh B or the Imam or the follower of a certain Sheikh who's been uh, following and they just heard that the 40 days or any one of these examples or they're unsure of maybe this thing is kind of weird to me Mm -hmm. now. Give them the advice. What did they do? They've been doing it 10, 20 years. My advice to them is, if this sounds strange to you, I fully understand and sympathize. Uh, I would probably feel the same way if I'm in your shoes. It's human nature. You've been doing something for so long, you think it's right. However, Allah blessed you with a brain. He gave you intelligence. Ask around. Talk to people. Speak. Research. Read. Think for yourself. If this action is not found in the Quran and Sunnah, and even if my people have been doing it for a hundred years. The Quran is Sunnah is not just a hundred years old. The Quran is the speech of Allah, eternal. 
The Prophet ﷺ 14 centuries ago came with a perfect message. Suppose my village has been doing something for a hundred years. Does this mean that for the time before them, this message was lost? That my village somehow discovered it? Don't be fooled by the quantity of people who are doing something that is incorrect. Look at how many people believe that God has a son. Are they right just because they are more than us or numerically so many? Don't be fooled by the quantity. Go back to the religious texts of the Qur'an and Sunnah and pray to Allah for guidance and you will find it. Jazakallah Thank you, yaakum. Shaykh. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. And I'd like to thank everybody who has sat through this. I hope you really got to benefit. Our intention is to help make things easier on you by delivering the truth. And it's very simple. We got the blueprint. We are Muslims who follow Islam, which means surrender and submission to the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And the verbatim word of God is His word. And you have the last and final messenger, His sunnah, His way. And if there is any difference of opinion in anything that, uh, of interpretation we got, the best of generation. So, if it's not in this blueprint, the Quran and the Sunnah, then do we really need to follow it? Think about it. Investigate. Make dua to your Creator up above. Ask Him to help you. Be humble-hearted, open-minded, and the truth will be clear. We hope to see you again here on the Dean Show every week with a new show. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you.